On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse Q&A, we talk with licensed marriage and family therapist Claudia Sine Mosias about our narcissistic society, the authentic self versus the real self, and then we deep dive into my own fake self in the hopes that Claudia can help me become a more authentic person going forward. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse Q&A, a podcast that interviews mental health professionals, lawyers, researchers, and authors about narcissistic and domestic abuse. I am your host, Brandon Chadwick, but my friends call me Chad, and thanks for tuning in to this episode. And before we get into our episode, let me state that this podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Please do not substitute the show for medical advice. If you are struggling, please do reach out to the current professional you use, or please do call your local domestic abuse agency. Speaking of professionals, we just started our own directory of mental health professionals at abusetherapy.org. Yes, that is abusetherapy.org. So if you are looking for someone to talk to, please do go there to find someone. Using one of those professionals from our directory helps support the show, and we'll be adding as many diverse professionals as we can in the upcoming weeks. If you are a professional and want to be part of our directory, please do email me at directory at abusetherapy.org. Also, we have another show. It's our sister show. It was our first podcast called Narcissist Apocalypse, and it's survivor stories only. So if you are a survivor of a narcissist and narcissistic abuse, narcissistic parents, go listen to Narcissist Apocalypse, our original podcast. It'll help you feel less alone in the world. And before I get out of my own way and start the show. And FYI, I'll leave all of Claudia's contact information in the description of the show so it's easy for you to find. And also, make sure you stay until after we say our goodbyes. Why, you may ask? Well, after we ended this show, I decided to take all of the information and helpful advice that Claudia imparted on me and I started to apply it to my life. So I can't give you an update on what happened after right now because eventually you're here. We had a mini therapy session during it. And I think once you hear how Claudia helped me, many of you out there will become big fans and want to work with her going forward. So I'm just kind of throwing that out there so you make sure that everyone stays and listens to the end. So even when the show ends, it's after that. And it won't I won't be that long. I'll give you a brief update of what's gone on since uh, this show has happened. And now it's time for the show here is my conversation with Claudia Sine Mosias. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse Q&A. With me today, I have Claudia Sine Mosias. She is an online therapist only based out of California. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist in practice for 32 years and specializing in treating narcissistic abuse, relationship issues, anxiety, and depression. Thank you for coming on to the show today. Hi, Brandon, and thanks for having me. So you are a solution-based therapist that helps unearth long-standing behavior patterns or negative perceptions that may be holding people back from experiencing a more fulfilling and meaningful life. So can you explain to me how your therapeutic approach applies to narcissism and narcissistic abuse, and does your approach apply to those who have been abused but also to those uh, narcissists uh, themselves to be treated as well? Sure. So let me start by saying that if you've been a victim of narcissistic abuse, especially as a child, you've absolutely had long-standing negative behavior patterns and thoughts. And unearthing these behaviors and thoughts is how we deal and eliminate the symptoms, such as anxiety, depression, and codependence, as you mentioned, that are caused by these behaviors. So this is what I do, is I unearth these behavioral patterns and thoughts. Because understanding ourselves is the key to living in our authentic or real self. And we'll be talking a lot about 
that more later. The narcissist lives inside a false self and encourages those around him or her to live there as well. So recovery means, in, at least in, in my definition, recovery means finding a real self. It's from that place that we can change our behaviors and our thoughts and eliminate our symptoms. Now, in terms of treating narcissists themselves, and does my technique work, um, to be honest with you, I've only had a few times that a client, and in, in 32 years, maybe two or three people, who have come into treatment wanting to be cured for their narcissism. My rule of thumb is that if you think you're a narcissist, you're probably not. Um, at least your narcissism is not far up the continuum scale of narcissism. So the question is, would finding the real self help the narcissist? Absolutely. But there's generally little interest uh, by the narcissist in, in pursuing this. So I hope that answers your question there. Yeah. So today we're going to be discussing mainly the false self versus uh, the real self and being able to find the real self within you after maybe living um, in, uh, inauthentically for a very, very long time. So before we begin that, can you define uh, narcissism uh, and before we get into, I guess, discussing the false self and uh, the authentic self? Yeah, um, narcissism is a very complex issue, and part of the reason that it's complex, and I'll just start by saying this, is that we all have narcissism. If we had no narcissistic tendencies at all, we probably would, you know, be living under a freeway someplace. We, we have to have, you know, one can say that on the very low end of narcissism is self-esteem, that we feel good about ourselves. We feel entitled to have a good life. We feel entitled to have a job. We feel entitled to have positive relationships. And then that goes all the way up to sociopathic narcissism, which is, you know, where you find your criminals and people that murder other people without a conscience. So it exists on a scale. But if you have been abused by a narcissist, you've been abused by somebody who has a false self, sometimes called a no self, but it always means that there's a tremendous amount of internal emptiness. So you know, I'm explaining what a narcissist is. So you've got this internal emptiness, and there needs to be something to fill that up. You need to create something, an alternative self. And what, what gets created is often grandiose, it's often self-involved, and it's often somebody without empathy. Most clinicians believe that narcissists are created, not born. In other words, it's not a, at least to our knowledge at this point, it's not a brain disease like schizophrenia, for example. It's created by others who had a false self and taught them that they weren't good enough. So in this way, we can see that the pathology of narcissism can get passed down through the, through the generations. Um, so narcissism itself, I don't know how many of your listeners are familiar with the DSM, which is kind of the Bible of diagnosis for therapists. And I'm going to talk here first about um, the uh, narcissistic personality disorder. And this is somebody who has, it's a pattern of, of grandiosity. It's somebody who needs a lot of admiration um, and it's somebody who has no empathy. And that means that they can't take the, the place of another. They can't feel what another person might be feeling. Um, it's a grandiose sense of self-importance, and these people believe that they're special or unique and can only be understood by other special and unique people. Oftentimes when a narcissist calls me as a therapist, there will be a test on the phone, which is this, this is a giveaway. How special am I? How unique am I? Do I match their level of specialness and uniqueness? I rarely do, so we go no farther and the appointment isn't made. Can you explain that you know, for, one, for one more second? Can you – that one little sure. bit there? Uh, about, uh, about, about, that, about that phone call. Phone. This might come in useful for me when I make phone calls to people. <laughs> yeah. So, um, off, you know, in fact, I can, I can reference somebody that called me just the other day. Um, and let me say this, too, that people who call – narcissists who call me are generally part of a couple – Rarely do I get an individual saying, please help me, I'm a narcissist. Um, so they're calling because they're complaining about their husband or their wife. And they want to test me to make sure that I am um, 
I'm on their side. I don't know these people, but of course I've got to be on their side automatically. Um, I have to understand them perfectly. And if I miss a cue, then I'm eliminated. Um, and, you know, oftentimes these people will go on and on, not only about my degrees and experience, but where I went to school and what grades did I get, and just really kind of odd things. Um, so that's kind of a giveaway that they're looking for somebody that's as special as them. They're not going to find that by their own definition, so they never make the appointment. Does that help? Uh, yeah, because now, especially for the people out there who are listening, who uh, their partners say, yes, we want to go to uh, therapy together, that that the non-narcissist should be the one that makes the phone call and sets everything up just to make sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that yeah. They're, not, they're not getting themselves and they're not being railroaded uh, in this situation. Well, absolutely, and, the, and the, the, the therapist will never be good enough for the narcissist. Going back to this situation earlier or last week, um, the woman called me first, and we had a nice conversation. I always do a you know, 10- or 15-minute free consultation on the phone, and she said, this is fine. I, I think you're great. You need to talk to my husband. He insists. So I talked to the husband for, again, 10 or 15 minutes, and, you know, uh, he, I wasn't good enough. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it's like that. And, and oftentimes that's the, that's a ploy uh, in a narcissistic couple where one partner will want a, want a therapist, the other partner will say, okay, and then no therapist is ever good enough. So it doesn't go anywhere. Well, I think you're great. <laughs> <laughs> and I railroaded you on that question. So let's get back to you were going down the DSM-5 uh, oh, manual. Yeah. The next thing uh, in that is uh, that the narcissist is preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, beauty, brilliance, or ideal love. Now, we most of us have heard of the term love bomb, and that's what happens at the beginning of a relationship. The, the non-narcissistic partner gets love bombed. That's the ide- ideal love fantasy. And so the, the, the victim of that thinks, oh, wow, this is, this is great but it's really just part of that narcissistic pattern. So if you're love bombed early on in a relationship, just overwhelmed with somebody thinking that you're the most beautiful, you're the most brilliant, all of that, be be very, very cautious. Um, The next thing about about narcissists is they have a huge sense of entitlement and unreasonable expectations of other people. Um, Again, going back to my own practice, um, I recently had a a woman uh, call me, and she had been supporting her husband through law school for five years. Um, He was out of law school for the next three years where he did not work. He did not pass the bar. She continued to support him. Uh, He up and leaves her and then takes her to court for an outrageous amount of uh, spousal support. Uh, And, you know, this is un. By anybody's standards, this is an unreasonable expectation. She supported this guy for, I think, a total of eight years. He contributed absolutely nothing. And yet his sense of it was, you owe me. So that's kind of a, a giveaway to, to a narcissist. Um, the narcissist, as I've said before, lacks empathy, um, the ability to put him or herself into somebody else's shoes. They're often envious or they suspect that people are envious of them. Uh, more commonly, you see a lot of arrogance and haughty behaviors or attitudes. And then I want to make a point here that um, about the, the percentage, 50 to 75% of, of narcissists are males, and this is narcissistic personality disorder. So it, it's slighted it, when you, in the population, it, it's, uh, it favors males for the narcissistic personality development. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I, I, I think our audience is 75% to 80% women that listen to the show. Oh. <laughs> well, then that's probably it's right, the, That's right there. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly the same. Yeah. So um, I, I want to say, too, uh, about this, you know, the continuum of narcissism is that many highly successful people have narcissistic traits. Um, but it's only when these traits are inflexible, persistent, or cause harm or distress to others that they uh, constitute 
narcissistic personality disorder. So somebody that's successful, that's kind of, you know, full of themselves, that doesn't mean they have a narcissistic personality disorder. So we have to be, you know, careful uh, when we throw these terms around. But according to the DSM, 6.2% of the American population has full-blown narcissistic personality disorder. That's 20 million people. A lot of folks. That's a lot more that, than that, I, when I initially started doing this, that's a lo- way more than I thought that it was going to be. Like, I thought it was going to be like 1%. No, yeah. unfortunately, 6.2. And, and I, I haven't done the research on this of, of, you know, how it's grown over the years, but I would imagine, and we'll get into this later, you know, the influences on narcissism of why it's, why it's increasing. Um, but that 6.2% does not count the millions of other people who fall short of a narcissistic personality disorder, uh, but they're on the spectrum uh, or scale of, of pathological narcissism. So, so you, yeah, you, you, dis- you discussed um, – uh, you, we were just – you just mentioned societal influences. So right. before we had this talk, I mean, when, when we initially got into contact with each other, I think it was in December, a big interest of yours was how society got here. And so, right. can, yeah. so can you, uh, within what you've researched, can you uh, enlighten us with what you think has gone on? Well, some of it is, is recent. Most of it is not recent. The, the societal influences to narcissism have always been there. Um, my my uh, theory, my working theory, is that it's become so prevalent because we're in an information age. Everybody knows everything about everybody else. There's, there's, we've just got information overload. So um, uh, we're more aware of the, uh, these societal influences. There's, for example, the first one that I want to talk about is the, the haves and the have-nots. There, there's always been haves and have-nots, always. The gap's always been there. Um, the haves had exploited the have-nots for centuries. But as society grows, some of the have-nots, and I'm going to use the example, the example of women here, um, have, have developed voices. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You can't do that. Hence the Me Too movement. So we've called, we've called out male narcissists who tried to prevent us from taking our place in society and exploiting our sexuality. And our public awareness of these male narcissists now and how power entitles them to exploit us without empathy has brought narcissism into the public conversation. So um, I think that, that actually the voices of women in calling out male narcissists, uh, especially men in, in power, um, has, has really uh, brought this to the, to the forefront of the national conversation, and I'm, I'm happy about that. And in saying that, I want to say that not all males are narcissists and not all males are exploiters. If we go back to the percentage of Americans, and that includes women, it's you know, a relatively small percent. But, but I do think this idea that, that this, this inequality between people, uh, uh, women are less than men, allows men to be narcissists. It, it gives them permission. So that's a societal influence. Along the same lines is racism that the need to feel superior is inherent in the narcissist. And when we condone one race to declare itself superior, this unleashes latent entitlement in the narcissist and allows him to exploit, torture, or kill others in the name of, of his superiority. See, I never, I never looked at it in that way before as far as racism and narcissism go and superiority and entitlement. So this is, this is quite interesting. Yeah, it, it is fascinating, the, these, these societal influences. And, you know, su- superiority, of course, is false, but it props up the false self of the narcissist and brings him or her to temporary relief from their inherent fears. If I'm superior, I don't have to feel fearful. And you got to say, well, what are you so afraid of? And my answer to this, and we'll get way more into this when we talk about the false and the real self, is that I'm not good enough. There isn't enough. And unless I diminish others, my inferior, inferiority is going to be exposed. 
And this is what makes up the false self of the narcissist. The bully, the sexist, the racist, the exploiter, the superior person, the smartest one in the room, the entitlement, the, t- the entitled person. But it's important to know that this is a narcissistic mask, hiding the emptiness and the fear that lives beneath the mask. The narcissist fears that if you take away the mask, there'll be nothing left. So, yeah, I, I, racism, racism feeds narcissism, and narcissism feeds racism. racism. It's, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle that goes on there. Since we're talking about these kinds of things, um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, you know, another theater into, in, into at least American culture. And I know this is controversial for some people. So let me preface this by saying I'm not attacking President Trump's policies. I am going to speak about him as a, ra- as a narcissist, not uh, as his policies. Um, and it has nothing to do with whether or not I favor immigration restrictions or not. Um, so, but what, what Trump has done in terms of narcissism is he's brought into focus the dangerousness of these people. Um, he's, he, too, has brought narcissism into the public conversation. Uh, I have to say that this has been an interest of mine, narcissism, for most of my career. I started back in the 90s when people didn't even know the word. And there's been nobody in the world, I don't think, who has brought this term uh, to the consciousness more more than Donald Trump. But as a negative influence, he's unleashed covert narcissists to become more overt. And we see this in, in what's happened with white supremacists. The premises. He's made it okay to say we are superior to somebody else. Um, by the same token, his crassness and his incivility has invited others to behave with crassness and incivility, and essentially that's lack of empathy. It's now okay to not have empathy for people. It's now okay to call them names, to make fun of them. So to, to a portion of the population in in this country and maybe others who admire him, he's legitimized the lack of empathy. And he's also legitimized whatever doing whatever is necessary to achieve one's ends. These are classic narcissistic personality disorders uh, uh, techniques. This is classically what they do. And so I I just, a little sidebar here, back in the 50s, Uh, there was a lot of research done in England on group dynamics. And this group of of thinkers, of of, uh, of scholars, met in a small community called Tavistock where they they hold themselves out for months on a time and came up with some theories about how how people behave in groups. And so it's now called the Tavistock theory. And basically, it's very common now, it's a top-down phenomenon. The leader of a corporation, the leader of a family, the leader of a country, the leader of a religion, their attitude trickles down. So that's what we have here now, at least in America, is um, uh, you know this trickle-down thing of people behaving badly because the person at the top says it's okay to behave badly. It's okay to behave like a narcissist. Now, fortunately, the vast majority of people in the United States are not narcissists, but I'm saying that it has encouraged these latent or covert narcissists to become more uh, more overt. And the most noticeable place this happens is on Twitter, because I'm on Twitter all the time. And, you know, I have a pretty controlled Twitter in the sense of I follow people in the narcissistic abuse and domestic violence, domestic abuse community. And I really try and keep it at that. But occasionally I do venture off my little slice of of Twitter because Twitter has many different slices. But, you know, I would say a majority of Twitter is the cesspool of humanity in the sense of uh, no one everyone is yelling at each other and it is not productive in any way and people the bar of um morality or uh, i guess you know 
ethical, you know, bullying, whatever goes on there, it gets lowered to zero, negative, whatever. I mean, people do not treat uh, each other well at all uh, on, on Twitter. And when you type in the term uh, narcissism, because a lot of the times I do my best to promote uh, the website, promote uh, the podcasts, and and get the word out there, and you can't anymore with, with this word because all day it's about uh, it's people arguing over uh, the president or arguing over Hillary Clinton. Um, you know, it's a back and forth kind of thing, and it's uh, you know, as far as technology goes, has technology destroyed us in a way? Well, yeah, and that 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 goes to my my next social influence. It's, it's really good that you that you said that because I think technology is an absolute influence. And what technology does, it it enables us to act nar- narcissistically, even if we aren't, because we can avoid intimacy by discussing serious or painful topics through Twitter, text, email. Uh, we don't have to look into somebody's eyes. We don't have to look into their eyes when we break up with them or see their expression when we criticize them or um, experience their hurt when we bully them. We don't even have to hear the sound of their voice when we deliver bad news. So it, it, it really makes us anonymous. So we can, we can um, pander to our worst instincts there because there's no, uh, there's no consequence. We're not seeing somebody's face. We're not watching them cry. We're not, we're not seeing the shock. Uh, or the disgust, or anything. It's, it's, uh, it's just, uh, it's so removed and remote. And then the self-involvement and the grandiosity piece is encouraged by technology and things like uh, Facebook and Snapchat and um, um, Instagram. And, you know, this is kind of a, you know, um, when we're talking about racism and things like this, this is kind of a minor aspect of, of narcissism, but it still is there. It's like, look at me, and not only look at me, but look at me in my false, most perfect self. Um, I have a client who uh, is uh, really in, well, she has very low self-esteem. She's the child of a narcissist, and um, she looks at these Instagram posts of women who uh, are posting their perfect families online, their perfect beach homes, and their children in their lovely outfits, and their, you know, fresh flowers on the table, and and she really feels badly about that because she thinks that stuff is real. And I'm trying to tell her, you know, it's posed. It's, and if it isn't posed, it's the absolute perfect moment in, in the millions of moments of that day. So people get a false sense of, of what's real out there, and they, they feel badly about it. So, um, yeah, I think technology has done, you know, a tremendous amount to promote uh, narcissism, and like I said, the first thing I said, even if we're not totally narcissistic, it sort of invites us to be. Yeah, I with with Instagram, uh, Instagram type of narcissism, in in my opinion, is the the grandiose in the sense of a visual of how I look, vain, and and Twitter is uh, more of a look how smart I am. Um, yes. I'm much smarter than you. Uh, that's that platform. Facebook, I right now, I'm really not sure what Facebook uh, is. But Snapchat, I don't have any uh, really experience with because I am uh, 44 years old. So uh, <laughs> right. it, it's not a big thing. But it, it, in, in the future, I'm actually hoping – the one thing I do hope for is, you know, the next – I'm a technology nerd. And, you know, the next – in. Um, I guess big technology will be uh, augmented reality and virtual reality once the glasses are, are cheap enough uh, to be mass produced. And I, and I do hope that that will bring in a more face to face avenue when it comes to uh, social media and people might not be indoors as much because they might actually take these things outside because these things will be uh, interactive with kind of what is going on. And I'm hoping it will get people back out to play with each other with these things on their heads at the same time. But, but at least they'll be outside and interacting and seeing people in a face-to-face manner. I hope that a piece of technology can, that will bring people back to being with each other again. Yeah, 
which is quite odd that at first it brought you apart, but maybe it will bring you back. As, but you never know. Well, I, I like your hopeful attitude, Brandon, and I, I do think that all of this, uh, we're kind of coming to a head, aren't we, in, in, in um, this narcissistic world. And it's sort of like shining a light in, in the corners and, and having all the cockroaches come out. Once we see what's there in the darkness, then we can fix it. So well, why, while it's very disturbing to me to look at all of this stuff and to talk about all of this stuff, I think it's going to, to shed light and allow us to move forward as, as human beings. Uh, one more thing I want to say before I leave these causes of, of narcissism. We talked about the societal influence. And I want to sum up the psychological reason, and it's very simple to do because there's really only one basic reason. How did we get here to this place of narcissism? And it's because we weren't loved enough. We weren't approved of enough, and we weren't made to feel worthy. Simple, not much more to say about that, but... You know, that's where we all have to go. We have to look at our ability to love and to approve of others and to realize that we're all worthy. Um, that's gotten lost someplace. So, so, so anyway, go on. Oh, no. So in the grand scheme of things, uh, as far as this goes, what does this all mean as far as, I guess, the meaning of our existence? Well, so... Uh, <laughs> A long time ago when I was a baby therapist, I decided that I was going to be an existential therapist, and existentialism is a big word, but basically it, it's about meaning. It's the meaning of existence. Um, we've lost our way, or perhaps we've never even found it, and don't ask the questions of why are we here and what's our purpose. We don't ask this. And as a result, if we don't ask ourselves, marketers, Advertisers, politicians, theologians, they'll ask and answer that question for us. And their answers are self-serving. They say that we're here to consume, to buy, to wage war, holy or otherwise, to have the best car, the biggest house, the highest paying job, raise the smartest children, graduate from the best schools, be good, better, best, superior, no matter what it takes to do that, no matter who it hurts, outside of our family or our little tribe or our state or our country. And these standards of good, better, and best are externally in, imposed. It, there is no good, better, and best. It's all completely subjective. They don't usually come with, from a deep contemplative process of our own authentic best, and they don't support our real self. So. And... You know, this is a big issue with a lot of people. And when we discussed this a while ago, uh, this being the episode and this being the focus of our episode, what is your authentic self and what is your fake self? For me, you know, I am, you know, I am a codependent human being and, and, you know, I'm going to do my best here with you to kind of, you know, go through my own issues of, of, of what am I, who am I, um, and hopefully, you know, you'll guide me through a little bit of this process. And, you know, being a codependent human being immediately uh, my whole entire life, I would I guess I would say I would appease people. You know, I, w I was a people pleaser. I would do what was best to make a situation maybe just go away. So if someone was like, I need this, I need this, I, you know, I would never do anything kind of for myself. And I kind of always put everyone's mood first and I was uh, last. So I am a codependent. I have many irrational fears, which I guess as I'm older, I do have anxiety issues. A friend of mine recently, recently, I'm going to say within the last years, described me as a duck. And I said, what does that mean? And they said, you're calm above the water, but little does any, everyone know that underneath your feet are just frantically paddling. So, but no one can see it. And I laughed because my friend saw me <laughs> for what I was truly was. And, you know, it was nice to be seen in, in, in that sense. Um, 
so, you know, my belief system, you know, growing up and even to now, it, you know, it's not uh, the best, you know, and I know that a lot of my beliefs are are the great. So, you know, if I in, in my mind, so th- these are my beliefs. If I don't drop things for friends and family, they will be upset with me. And then I feel guilt about that. And I just don't feel guilty. I also feel if I don't do these things, then I won't be seen as being reliable. Because for me, a big part of my identity is being reliable. And so that's a double-edged sword right there. And that one is very difficult to um, get over because in a certain way, I li- you know, because I like that, that I am reliable and that's how I am seen. But is that be- me being authentic or is that me being uh, a-, a fake version of myself? Um, what else do I have here? I wrote all these things down for you to uh, then challenge me on. Um I, one thing, I do things a lot of the time because I have to, not because I want to. I wrote that down. And then a big thing, and this happened in the summer, and I will tell you the story. So when an authority figure challenges me, I feel small. I break into trying to prove myself in conversation. Uh, at least that's how it comes off. Uh, and in, in, the, in the summer... I was with my friend, and we went to uh, her hometown, and we went to dinner with her dad and her dad's friend, and her dad was asking me all these questions about the podcast, and he did it in a tone that I felt I was being talked down to, and the way I was answering the questions, I felt just very, very, very small, and when we got home, my friend says to me, what was that? And I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, when he was talking to you, the way you were answering is like, you were trying to prove yourself. She's like, what happened there? And I'm like, you saw and noticed that? And she's like, yes. And I'm like, oh, I, I, that's, that's not good. Um, but it's a lot, a lot of like tone or facial and facial expression. It throws me off and it makes me, I guess it made me feel incompetent the way I was being talked to. I really don't know the truth of that situation. If that's what was going on or if that was kind of the person I was talking to. Uh, but that's how I felt. Um, and now when I do these calls for, um, the website and things like that and, and the directory that we're building, you know, sometimes I, I rub up against people that are, um, very judgmental on the other side of the phone and I f- fall back into that kind of position instead of being uh, confident about what's kind of going on. So it's actually a, a problem for me, uh, right now. So, um, how would you kind of go about with me to challenge my uh, authentic self and real self and, and, and try to get me kind of back to where I need to be. Well, um, thank you for sharing all that. That's, that's a, that's a lot of stuff and it's, and it's incredibly honest. So it tells me that you already started the process of, of examining, examining yourself, which is of course, you know, inherent to, to any kind of healing. Um, and that you were open to the feedback of your friend who said, what was that? And, you, know, you, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't go into denial and say, what was what? <laughs> there was no other way to answer besides, like, because when you're, when you're authentically seen by your friends who love you, um, and you know it's coming from a place of general curiosity of and concern of what might be going on. There was only one way to answer that question in, in my mind. There was no, you know, I wasn't going to beat around the bush. I was like, oh, yeah. Um, you know, that's a good, that was a good friend. And they, you know, they, they saw me and then kind of comforted me at the same time. Be like, it's going to be okay. Yeah. So in, in all of these things that you said, I will I'll upset people. I won't be seen as reliable. Um, I do things because I think I should do them, not because I want to do them. What I hear in that, Brandon, is an awful lot of fear. And um, so I would ask you, what happened in your young life as a boy at home, at school, in the community that made you 
be so fearful so that you would have to build up these defenses. And the defenses are, I'll never upset anybody. I'll be completely reliable. I'll do whatever anybody wants me to do. Those are defenses. What made you so fearful? What happened to you as a kid? Well, and I, I know this. <laughs> this is why I was so. this is why I was afraid yeah. of doing this episode, but I knew this would make a you know I had I had to do this. Um, you, you know, my childhood. I grew up uh, in a I guess I would call it a dysfunctional home. I don't know what my parents would call it. Um, I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, I have, uh, I've talked about my brother before, but my brother grew, uh, I, I believe my brother probably had a borderline personality disorder and, you know, he had a, uh, temper and you didn't want to cross that temper. And this was from a very, uh, young age and he was, I guess, protected, in a sense by my mom because my mom was always protecting him from uh my dad and you know I didn't really see a lot of my you know I'd see him here or there growing up in the sense like he was he worked a lot but um I guess my dad had a, a temper I mean he's not like violent in any way but he had a temper so you were kind of scared of you know doing anything wrong for the temper but also they already had one child causing uh, a problem. So I took on the role of not causing any problems. But as far as, you know, I, you know, doing what you're told and, you know, being the projection of, of what the family needed from you at that point, you know, I was the youngest. So I looked at everything as, okay, this person's doing this and they're getting in trouble doing that. I won't do that. And this person's doing this and that's how they get treated. So being the youngest, you, you kind of see things from a different perspective. I obviously as the the oldest child, because you're, you're watching and observing a lot of the time of how people are treated. And, you know, as far as, kind of fear stuff goes that was instilled in me <laughs> my, my mom is a very worrisome person and um you know i guess you know that always got in, in, instilled uh you know deeply ingrained in me uh as we've gotten older you know my dad has become uh more uh, fearful, especially, uh, about, uh, death and as far as risks and things like that. So, you know, one of my friends, same friend from the summer rides a motorbike and they go to, uh, I'll give you a ride. I'm like, I'm not getting on the back of the motorbike. They're like, why? I go, well, first, because I'm too scared to. And second, if something happens to me, my mom <laughs> will, <laughs> will find you. If we both die, dig you up and kill you herself. So, it's kind of like those kind of fears. I am deathly afraid of heights. Um, so I've had things like that. But as far as like as far as a fear as people, um, I've always had a thing with uh, authority, and um, I've always kind of you know even if it's I'm in a situation um, where someone um, who's not an authority figure but still kind of has an authoritative tone, I, I really kowtow, uh, I think that's the term, uh, to, to them. And I just kind of fall in line and it's kind of just been my history. Um, and you know, I don't like confrontation. It hasn't like really in the last eight years is when I've really started to become a decent communicator. Um, and you know, I generally like being, liked and I don't like hurting people's feelings. So not liking to hurt people's feelings and being a good communicator sometimes don't mix, but I've been learning how to not feel as guilty. And the thing that I did work on for a while with my uh, first therapist was something I called the jerk syndrome where, you know, I'm allowed to say no to people and it's okay to say no uh, in situations and not feel guilty about it, but that's doing that is one thing, but there's, is this natural reaction that happens with me, uh, and feeling little amongst mainly people who are older than me. 
it's rare that it's like a 20-year-old probably wouldn't have that effect on me, maybe a police officer, but it's mainly with people who are older than me. So I guess that, that would be like, um, does that answer your question or did I s- skirt around to the whole thing? No, no. I mean, um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of conceptualize it into, into something, uh, maybe more cohesive Okay. and how I, how I see you in the family is you are somebody who wanted the family to be happy. You wanted the family to be at peace and you're dealing with a family that's got perhaps a borderline personality in there. Then you've got somebody in your mom who's, co- who's uh, codependent to that borderline personality. Yes. You didn't stand up to your father for maybe being abusive or harsh with your brother. So there's a lot of kind of emotional chaos that's going on in the family. And so here comes this gentle soul named Brandon, the youngest child. And all of this is very upsetting for him. And so he wants to make it better. And so in his child's mind, he thinks that he's the best little boy in the world. If he avoids conflict, if he doesn't upset anybody, if he's reliable, that he will uh, make all of this better. And I think that's what you were afraid of. I think you were afraid of people not being happy and not being at peace. You wanted to live in a peaceful, cohesive family, as, as we all do. And you took it upon yourself, um, sweet boy that you were, to try to make that happen. And, you know, that was a normal response as a child, Brandon. Um, you know, we have limited intelligence. Our brains are not fully developed. Our emotional selves are not fully developed. We do what we can. We develop these ideas of how can I fix this? And it was really a brilliant, sweet thing for that little boy to do. It's not functional as an adult. No, it's, it's not. Really, it, it, it's really not functional yeah. as an adult at all. Yeah. yeah. It really, really, really hampers your your ability um, as an adult. So, um, you know, you did these things to make you feel less afraid. You develop these habits, these patterns of thinking, these patterns of behavior to make yourself feel less afraid. And you were going to feel less afraid in a family that got along, that wasn't, you know, threatening in, in some way. Um, so I, I think the first step, and you've probably done this, I mean, I've only known you briefly, I don't know your whole history, but I hope you've done some, some forgiveness of yourself for these patterns of behavior that you developed as a boy. And, um, you know, it's, it's just simply time to move on. And everybody who has grown up in a narcissistic family, I, I did myself, um, you develop these patterns of codependence and being the, you know, I was the best little girl in the world. Um, and that was, that kept things, the fires kind of burning low and not, not, not raging forest fires in my family. Um, but good Lord, I can't do that for the rest of my life in, in all situations. Um, that made me very anxious. So that's why people who come from these narcissistic family situations develop a lot of anxiety. They take on these, ironically, it's kind of grandiose, isn't it? We think that as little kids we can solve all this, and, and we can't. And then we think as adults we can solve it. Well, I'll handle it. I'll take care of it. I, I'm reliable. That's pretty, that's pretty self-important. The truth is you're not that important, and you're not that capable. None of us are. We can't handle all of it. So, so there's that. The other thing, I want to address this issue of, of authority and how challenges make you feel small. Um, uh, I think that's, that's a really important one. And it goes into uh, some stuff that I wanted to talk about later, um, but maybe we can talk about it now. Um, relative ambition versus um, absolute ambition. Okay. So, so tell me again with the authority, if people make you feel, if they challenge you, I'm going to go back to your story about the... the, the yeah, a lot the, of it is in the tone. And, uh, it's, you know, a lot of the time I interpret thing as a condescending tone or a ton- condescending look. And when that happens, I just revert back as if I'm being judged. And well, I guess when I fe- start to feel that I'm being judged, I then have to feel that I, it's like I'm, now I'm looking up at you. And 
just as if I had someone on a pedestal, if it was a, you know, that's how people look at it in a relationship, but this could be anyone. And all of a sudden I'm doing my best to prove myself to you that I, I guess, am worthy of, um, well, I guess whatever story I am telling and uh, whatever kind of, if it's a business or something like that, instead of looking at them as my equal and that maybe, you know, in the sense of you should, you know, uh, you should tell other people about this thing and feel confident in that way. I'm trying to like sell in this from, I guess, in the sense of, uh, I guess I'm trying to, um, just, I guess, prove that, like, my idea that uh, whatever's going on is worth it in a sense. That, that, that's specifically what it, what's going on in the summer. As far as, um, like, with a police officer uh, and, and stuff in history kind of like that, sometimes as soon as a tone happened, I would just kind of fall backwards and kind of just fall in line and answer things and okay, not so – yeah. Go on. Oh, no, no. Uh, the, well, I, there was just one time in my life where I did kind of take my power back with a police officer, and it was years and years ago, and it was felt really good to do. And my friend who was with me while it was going on said, are you crazy? Like, why are you doing that? And I'm like, I don't know. I just feel that I have to. Um, but continue. Sorry, I interrupted. No, no. So, look. You are doing something, in my opinion, and it's actually my opinion doesn't matter. Your opinion matters. But let me just tell you my opinion. Yep. You are doing something with your podcast, with your, um, with your uh, website, uh, that is incredibly important. And to me, you are acting from an authentic place, that place that's the deepest place in yourself. And so – just just know that, and this is, this is primary, because when we act from that deepest place, the next step is to not be attached to the results of those actions. Mm -hmm. This is a really high-level uh, uh, kind of spiritual uh, place to go in, in oneself. Um, people might like what you do. They might not like what you do. If you're, if you're what I call a, um, uh, you know, if you're in a transaction, if I do this, then I'm going to get that, uh, you will always be disappointed. Inevitably, you'll be disappointed because sometimes life works that way. We do this and we get that. We put out a podcast and everybody applauds. Sometimes we put out a podcast and people go on Twitter and say, what the hell was that? Mm -hmm. That was ridiculous. How dare you? Um, so... What are, we, what are we to do? We can't be subject to that, that external opinion. So first of all, and this is primary, if you get in touch with yourself, if you ask who I am, what am I doing here? What am I doing on this planet? What's my life's work? Um, and then you ask from that place, if somebody likes that, then great. And if they don't like it, then okay, they don't. But I would think, Brandon, that you're, even though I think you should be in that absolute place, because I think what you're doing is beautiful, you haven't quite owned that mm -hmm. because you're, su you're subject to somebody's tone of voice or somebody's expression of, of disapproval. And it really doesn't matter because if you came from, from an absolute place, you're doing what you're doing because you love to do it, because you're compelled to do it because it's coming from the deepest part of you and when we act from that place it really doesn't matter what anybody else thinks because that action is its own reward you understand what i'm saying yes uh, you yeah. know my, i guess you know my old wound i guess would be you know feeling voiceless or uh misunderstood so i guess when i do a lot of that stuff and i feel that the other person isn't open-minded or listening mm -hmm. it i guess it mm -hmm. takes me back to that specific wound and yeah. it, it, it takes me back to being a kid and it really it hits it so uh you know working on not um you know understanding that everyone is i guess different 
um, that this always won't be received in that way. People just don't have the capacity to have an open mind uh, kind of going forward. And when maybe a big thing might be when this does happen, um, I don't know if you agree or not agree, uh, end, end the conversation, <laughs> you know, it, you know it, that it's not worth my time in that sense and that I don't have to prove anything to anyone and, you know, that you, don't, you don't like it. And, you know, instead of listening or doing this for 30, this dance for 30 minutes, uh, let's just end it in five minutes and I'm going to move on. Is that something you would say to do or how else would you yeah, tell me well, to kind of go yeah. about it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, we can't just do that out of thin air. Yes. You know, we have to back up to kind of what what I've been, you know, trying to talk about this afternoon. And that is to really examine who we are and what we're doing here. What is our purpose? People don't. People don't ask that question. If you ask that question and you contemplate it deeply, mm -hmm. then you move from that place. And if other people like it, great. Have a piece of my cake. Mm -hmm. And if they don't like it, okay, I guess you like pie. It doesn't matter. You're not attached to those results. And, uh, you know, being attached to results, you know, again, letting go of results does not mean that you're letting go of all of your ambition. Um, and, you know, again, this, this talk about relative ambition, which ties us to the results of our, of our work, and absolute ambition, which causes us to work for work's sake, for the joy that comes from whatever work we're doing to express our divine creativity. That is its own reward. Not whether or not somebody approves of it or buys the book or signs up for your class. And, you know, yeah, all of that, sometimes life gives us that, too, that somebody does sign up for our class and somebody does buy our book. Um, but that can't be the end goal because then we're just constantly being dragged around psychically uh, by the opinions of others. And, and especially people who have been narcissistically abused where those opinions were so, uh, so crucial to your very survival as a child, um, you really have to break that cycle or you're going to be a victim of other people's opinions forever. Well, you saying that right yeah. now, I, I now, you know, you know how you have those moments where you're like, you have to feel it to understand it. And sometimes you're like, you cognitively know what you've said, but it takes a little bit for that switch to turn on. I, I, I understand what you're saying. I, like I, it, it kind of, I was playing around with it in my head while you were talking. I understand. And, um, I'm going to, so you just bought, you just bought my book. You just ate my cake. And that's <laughs> great. And I no, no. Like, uh, you know, but I also, I would also felt good if I said it. And you didn't buy the book, and you didn't eat the cake because I really believe it. It's my yeah, it's the, my purpose to say that to put that out. Can yeah, yeah, and you know, it's an interesting perspective to look at it from. I look at it as the you know the capitalistic versus. And that's how I'm thinking of it: a capitalistic kind of me versus altruistic me. And I like altruistic me. And altruistic me is is a great that you yeah. know that's how this all started. It, you know, it started off just because I liked talking to people, and. Coming from, I think, you know, in my mind, when going into these situations, coming from that point of view instead of the other point of view uh, when, when talking with people, in my mind already makes a huge difference. Um, are, there, are there practices and things for me to kind of move into this type of feeling uh, more or thought process? Well, you know, um, you know how, do, how do we do this? We've, we've been talking about some really big things, how... How do we go to the authentic self? Brandon, it's a, it's a life's work. Mm -hmm. It's a life's work. When, when I was a young woman in my 20s, um, I, was, I, I went into a, a spiritual school, and in that school uh, we were taught um, some very valuable things, some that I still use today. But, but one is that it's important to understand what the great work is for you, the great work, and how do you do that? And, 
And the great work is the life's work. You're not going to find it, you know, in an hour, in a day, in a lecture, in a book. In a, it's, it's all of it. It's what you're doing. So let me give you some suggestions and your, your, your audience, some suggestions of how do we find out the truth of who we are. Um, well, uh, Self, let's start with the, with the obvious. You're talking to a therapist. The, the self-exploration through therapy or some other avenue. You know, there's traditional therapists like myself. There's, there's uh, therapeutic, uh, you know, programs. There's life coaches, um, you know. But to talk to somebody, an objective uh, third party who is trained and can listen to you and reflect back in ways even that your best friends can't. Now, friends are great, of course, and you just gave us a great example of that. Um, but I really do recommend, especially if you are a, a survival, survivor of narcissistic abuse, that it's really hard to untangle all of this um, by yourself. And, of course, you, Brandon, are contributing to that kind of therapeutic process by having therapists on your program and by talking about these things. So there's, there's that. Um, Meditation. Um, meditation does not have to be a religious or spiritual phenomenon, but sitting in silence and clearing your mind, or watching your thought or thinking of one thought or watching the breath or whatever, has this kind of miraculous uh, effect of giving us perspective. And if nothing else, I mean, I can go on in another time about all the benefits of meditation that, that are outside of the scope of what we're talking about today. But when I recommend meditation to my clients, I recommend it because it brings perspective. If we calm the mind down, even for a short period of time, any day, um, it, broadens, it broadens how we see things. We get caught in these narrow ruts, and meditation kind of opens that up. So I can't recommend that more if you don't if, if it's hard for you to sit in a, in a meditation then try yoga where where you're doing that breathing and there's usually a brief period of meditation in a yoga class but again it calms the body it calms the nerves and it allows for for um uh perspective um so inside of that bag would be breath work which you would find in not only yoga, but many, many uh, martial arts, uh, Tai Chi would do that and others. Um, and, of course, you know, spiritual study, if you are inclined to do that, whether you're a Christian or whether you're a yogi or whether you're a Buddhist or whatever, listen to the quote-unquote masters. What have they got to say? What have the great scriptural texts got to say about who we are and what we're doing here? Um, along that line, to, I think, just awareness and presence. Presence is, I don't think, talked about enough. People are so busy. We're so distracted. There's so much. To actually be present with a conversation. One of the things I love about being a therapist is it forces me to be present. If I'm not present, then, wow, I, I'm lost. You know, I haven't done my job. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't make the car. I didn't... Uh, I didn't tally the, the, the tally sheet. I have to be present with people. And when you're present with people, you learn a lot. Um, I'm present with you or any client um, because I'm, I'm there to help you, but being present helps me too. It helps me listen. It helps me, again, open up my, my uh, perspective to, to a, broader, uh, a broader scope. So being aware, reading, listening, being present. And then the last thing I want to mention is the company of like-minded people, the company of wise people. You know, there's a lot of chatter out there. We don't need to listen to all of the chatter. If you go deep inside, if you calm yourself enough, you're going to know who's wise and who isn't wise, who's just spouting nonsense and who's actually saying something, whether they're saying that in, in a written text I'm a big fan of Eckhart Tolle. I think he, he says some really brilliant things that are very helpful. Um, Brene Brown, I mean, I could go on. There's a lot of people. Um, but to keep company with those people, <coughs> whether they're, you know, in a book, on a podcast, or in your life, keep company with wise people and listen to them. 
So that's my suggestion of, of how to do it. And it sounds simple, but it's, it's, there's a lot. If you follow any one of those suggestions, it'll keep you busy for a while. I'm going to, well, the one thing that I always um, want to get into is meditation, and and I always have trouble, but uh, I will try with with that. Yoga, you know, I I thoroughly enjoy yoga. Right now, I've I've been so busy with work, I have not done my yoga, but when I was doing yoga, as far as... Yeah, I was also running at the time, but my yoga practice, I would do hot yoga. I'd never been in physically stronger shape, but also mentally, I, I, I probably was at my strongest while doing yoga and... It, you know, because you know the breath work that was going on, the clearing of your body, and I just, it was just you know, it, it, it was really to me, yoga is the ultimate in physical uh, heart, in mind and soul um, exercise. So, you know, if anyone out there listening, I'm gonna after this, I'm gonna I have my mat behind me. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna start doing it again. Um, so. Before we end our show, uh, do you want to take some audience questions? Okay, sure. All right. So I'm going to read them. You're going to answer them to the best of your ability. I don't know if every single question, technically, uh, you'll know better than me when it comes to um, the laws. Because you know, people who send in questions sometimes don't understand that a mental health professional can only answer more general kind of questions and can't get into actual medical help. So everyone in the future, remember that. So here's the first question. How or what are some ways, methods of finding your authentic self after emotional narcissistic abuse? Is that something we've already answered? Well, yeah, we kind of answered it. Um, I I think, uh, you know, to that specific question would be to find a good therapist. Um, or to find um, a group um, where, you know, if, if you're actually, if you have had narcissistic abuse, you really do need to heal. Um, uh, but I don't use that word abuse lightly. I, you know, work with many, many people. And, um, you know, find yourself a good therapist who specializes and knows about who really does know about narcissistic abuse. You know, we all can't be all things to all people. I don't treat people with drug addictions. I don't know about that. I don't treat children. I'm not embarrassed to say that I'm not all things to all people, but find somebody who really knows what they're doing uh, with that. Um, So, again, the question was what? That question was uh, how or what are some ways, methods of finding your authentic self after emotional narcissistic abuse? Okay, so I gave those earlier with the with the meditation and the awareness and the like-minded people and all of that. Um, but uh, know that you need to find your authentic self, and the first way to find to find that is know that it exists and want to find it. If you've been with a narcissist, you've lived in a fantasy world. You've lived in a false world where there's lies and there's ghosting and there's um, uh, gaslighting and all of that. Know that a real self exists, a real world exists, and find it. And if you aren't happy and calm and at peace most of the time, not all of the time, you probably aren't living in your authentic self. So... Trying to find the authentic self, and that's the place that you can heal from. And that's where you will feel happy. And happiness is an underrated emotion. If we're happy, we're probably on the right track to whatever we're doing. So I I don't know if that answers you, but... Yep. So next question we have here. Um, I want to know how to feel okay about asking for what I want. Will I ever not cringe when I say I want to do this or that? Usually I try to guess what the other person wants to do. Yeah. Uh, Well, let me me be totally honest. I still cringe sometimes. Uh, I, I, I still do. 
Um, but it doesn't stop me. Um, eventually, you cringe less. That's what I can say. Okay. Um, but you have to. You have to learn to tolerate the discomfort when you first start working these muscles. These are new muscles that have been lying dormant for, you know, decades, maybe. Um, and, you know, feeling a bit uncomfortable, it's not the end of the world. It's worth it to, to get in touch with your real self. Um, so would you say yeah. in, in this sense that, you know, you're with, with people who are in these situations were beginners – and to be easy on yourself, because if you kind of remember, you know, if you're going to be picking up the sport of baseball for your first time, you're not going to be good at baseball on your first day. So right, exactly. it's in the same sense that it's just going to take time and to like ease into it and remember we're beginners. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one of the things to ask yourself uh, Asking for what you want. I, I want to kind of uh, unpack the question a little bit. Will I ever feel okay about asking for what I want? Ask yourself another question, a similar, a corollary question. Is this relationship reciprocal or not? And if it's not, why not? And understand that asking for reciprocity in a relationship, you give, you take. I give, I take. You talk, I talk. It's my issues today, it's your issues tomorrow. Asking for reciprocity is not asking for all the cookies in the jar. And when you find yourself in a relationship where it is not reciprocal, it's time to stop that relationship, and sometimes that's a big cringe. You know, ah, I, uh, but, uh, you know, is it worth it to have this time-consuming, non-reciprocal relationship that's never about you? So, yeah, I mean, we want it to be otherwise. And maybe that's what the cringe is, not so much that I have to do this. But, gosh, I wish, I wish the world were a better place and I didn't have to do this. Um, nobody wants to do it. Nobody wants to stop relationships or ask for things that, that they should be, you know, given automatically. Um, but, yeah, forgive yourself for having to cringe. And, and know that after all of these years, experienced therapists who specialize in this still cringe. All right. Next question. At the beginning of a relationship, is the narcissist showing us their authentic self or are they constantly showing us a false self? So even when it's good, it's false. And then even when it's bad, is that false? If so, knowing that they will never change, can they be described as authentically inauthentic? Uh, does that make question even make, does that make sense? <laughs> this question cracks me up. Um, I, I don't think authentically inauthentic is a thing. Um, <laughs> I can't wait to word this question on, uh, you know, uh, on like the the podcast when what this this what's this little a podcast episode about and writing out this question. Everyone would be like, is this a riddle? <laughs> so. Um, yeah, it's a confusing question. Does the narcissist always show a false self, and can they be described? Well, let's talk about the love bombs, and I'll, you'll see where I'm going with this. The love bombs at the beginning of a relationship uh, may be the real self of the narcissist, as love, infatuation, lust. These are powerful emotions. They might, they might actually feel that love, lust, infatuation, at the beginning of a relationship. Um, but it also might be a manipulation. And I don't know that the narcissist even understands him or herself what it is. So it's difficult to say. Um, the other important point I want to make about this is going back to our discussion of narcissism on a continuum and that only the most extreme forms of narcissism, the actual personality disorders, are are functioning behind a mask all the time. Um, almost all people have some narcissistic traits, and those at the lower end of the continuum of narcissism can act authentically at times. Yeah, so um, if, you, if you notice narcissism in your partner or your friend or your mother or your father, and it's, it's not a full-blown 
personality disorder, you might say, well, you know, they told me they loved me that day. Were they lying? Well, probably not. You know, um, again, remember, there's a continuum with this. And you mentioned masks there. So we have another question, and this question says, what are the masks, personal side versus business side, that we normally wear in specific situations, and are they still considered authentic? As well, what's the difference between those and the masks that the narcs wear for their fake self or false self? Does that question make sense? Yeah, it's a difficult question. Um, of course, there's, there are ways of behaving in professional situations that are considered, uh, you know, decorous or respectful or even protocol. And to go along with that is not being inauthentic. Authentically, I would never wear shoes. And occasionally, I like to let loose with swear words. But I refrain from doing that in my professional life because it's not professional. It doesn't make me inauthentic. Um, these things uh, are kept in check so that I can, as a story, I don't make people needlessly uncomfortable. And anyway, I can live quite easily with my shoes on and, and not swearing for a few hours. So I'm merely acting like a socialized human being. It doesn't damage me in any way or keep me a victim. And that's, that's the key point. Acting behind the mask keeps you a victim. Uh, putting your shoes on when you're, you know, meeting with a, with a client does not make you a victim. It just makes you socialize. Um, the other thing I want to say that about this is uh, if the masks we wear don't have consequences, like I mentioned earlier, uh, then they probably aren't inauthentic. Um, narcissists wear false masks because they have no idea of who they are without them. They're profoundly empty, and their mask wearing is often used to manipulate and win or dominate or control. So it's not, it's not a, you know, a hard and fast answer like most things. I, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, well, I actually, that was, you, you, uh, you told that, uh, <laughs> you answered that really well, actually. And uh, I got a very good understanding, especially when you were discussing the mask right there. Um, but now I, that was the last question. So I just want to thank you for answering these questions and being on today's uh, episode and discussing uh, a lot of topics that uh, I found interesting and for, uh, you know, helping me with my own issues. I, I hope everyone out there um, enjoyed that and um, learned from my, my experience with you. I know what I have to do kind of going forward from here on out. And before we leave, where can we find you? Okay, um, you can find me uh, on my website, which is ClaudiaSineMosiasMFT.com, or you can email me at Claudia at SanFranciscoCounseling.com. And for everyone out there, it is spelled C-L-A-U-D-I-A, and the last name is S-I-N-A-Y hyphen M-O-S-I-A-S. And I will also put that on the description of the show. And if you want to email me, if you want to find out more about Claudia, she will also be on our directory at abusetherapy.org. You can find her there as well. And we'll, you know, have you back on the show. We'll, we'll discuss more. I love talking to you today. And I'm going to take everything that I learned and apply it to myself immediately. <laughs> Um, it's because, you know, I need to, and it's useful. And, um, I hope everyone out there, uh, who is listening gives uh, Claudia a call as well. And, um, I guess, thank you for being on the show. Thank you. It was really a pleasure. I'm, I'm happy you've done it. All right. So everyone out there listening, I hope you have a good night. So hopefully you all stayed. And the show was, we had a false ending right there. And now this is, 
I think three weeks later, it might be four weeks later from when we recorded this episode. And in the last three to four weeks, I have been working on not being attached to results. And let me tell you, I've had some ups and downs. (laughs) Um, I did start doing yoga again on the mats that are behind me. So that was one plus. Uh, Did I have anxiety during this period? I did. Um, I have anxiety issues. So uh, that was kind of still going on. Were they lessened? Uh, I guess... I had ups and downs. That's the best way I'll put it. I had some, you know, I had some bad days where I started overthinking things. But as far as not being attached to results and how I was acting going through specifically like my sales calls and things that had to do were with this podcast and, and the sister podcast, which is Narcissist Apocalypse Survivor Stories. I was way more confident and a lot of the time, you know, when Claudia said to me not to be attached to results, I really went in with that mentality and my mentality, I I started seeing everyone as an equal and that, you know, if you did not want to be part of the show and what we were doing, that it was your loss. It wasn't my loss. And, you know, because in my, my belief, what we're doing here is, is pretty cool. And I kind of just went in with that attitude in the sense of, you know, if you don't like what we're doing, you don't like it. And even if you have nothing nice to say um, about kind of what we're doing or you just didn't think it was a good idea, it really didn't matter to me that much. So work-wise, I had a, a, a pretty good attitude about things and you know obviously there are ups and downs in the sense of you know some like three or four days things aren't 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 going well and then all of a sudden boom um things happen but i i I tried to just kind of stay positive and and go through that but if there was one big down that would have been uh hopefully i don't know if my dad's gonna be listening (laughs) to this but there was a day where you know i got unsolicited um i'm not going to call it advice i got just unsolicited opinion from a family member i already named him and it was not uh you know it was about what i was doing here and what we built and it was not uh positive and so i was pretty upset about that and i knew just to shake it off you know for about a half a day i was quite upset um with the negativity that that came my way about it and there was nothing i could do uh you know i just had it like you know it was an old wound that got hit i reacted i didn't react in the sense i didn't react and say uh, i didn't well uh, there 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 was something attached to that i was i was attached to the results i guess of being good enough and it took me about a half a day to kind of work myself through that really clear my mind and eventually really about six hours later seven hours later i was able to do some self-care and shake it off and i haven't really thought about it in the same way i i actually just kind of shrugged it off since then and kept kind of chugging forward and um knowing better you know i i talked to some people uh during that during that period and just kind of get a little bit more positivity uh in there but uh you know uh you know rome was not built in a day and you know these things are going to happen but 
it with really within the three to four weeks, it really has been a positive improvement, especially uh, with strangers. And now um, just to try and continue to do it and uh, keep chugging forward and not being attached to results. So thank you for everyone who uh, listened to me today and Claudia. And, and now officially, because I'm rambling, I hope everyone has a great night. 